Well, I think that now we can uh, come to the subject matter. It's uh, five oh five. So once again, I'd like to wish you a warm welcome to today's digital meeting to on this very important day today. Today is the European uh, Protest Day uh, for equal Equality for Persons with Disabilities. And this is a uh, an issue which is important for me personally and also politically. It's important that we include the labor market, uh, that we ask ourselves what happens after school. How can an inclusive labor market look like? How can the transition um, from a sheltered workshop to the primary uh, labor market uh, work? What is the situation in the European Union, what do other countries do differently than Germany, and uh, maybe we can learn from other member states. That would also be a question to be raised. Uh, today's uh, title is A Shift of Paradigm, Inclusive Working Instead of Segregation, European Paths Out of the Sheltered Workshop System. We have here three or four important uh, speakers who are going to present uh, their uh, perspective. And uh, I'm going to give a short introduction into the topic, and then I will give the panelists uh, the floor. We have here with us, which is a great pleasure for me, Mr. Franz uh, Wolfmeier. Uh, who has um, advanced inclusive uh, work and labor, especially in Austria, is co-founder of Chance B and former president of the EASP of the European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities. A warm welcome to you, Mr. Wolfmeier. I'm really glad you're with us. Then I'd also like to uh, greet Ms. Uh, Aideen M. Hartney from Ireland, Director of the National Disability Authority in Ireland. Hello, good afternoon. I'm very happy that you're going to speak uh, about the Irish perspective and that you report a little bit on the situation currently in Ireland. And I'm also very glad that Mr. Luis Servilla from Spain is today here with us. Uh, in the panel, and also and uh, together with uh, Steph de Kock uh, from Belgium. Uh, Mr. Sevilla is Associated Director of the WISE Network, a um, work of social enterprises in the European Union. And he works together with Steph de Kock, who is advisor at the Madwerk Group, also a social enterprise. And before I give the floor to Mr. Wolfmeier, uh, maybe uh, briefly a few facts on today's uh, protest day or action day. What is the situation today, 10 years after ratification of the European Disability Convention? I think the situation is still bad for persons or people with disability, less than 50% have a job, and um, many uh, remain segregated for their entire life in workshops for persons with uh, disabilities. That's where they're employed. Uh, they don't have receive minimum wage, and uh, they don't have an employment status. And um, the passage to the primary um, labor market is at basically impossible. That is something I can at least say for Germany. And uh, this is clearly a breach of uh, the Disability Convention, Article 25, in which it is said that uh, participation is a human right. Everybody has the right to participation also in the labor market and has a right to appropriate uh, pay. Uh, the, the European Union has presented uh, uh, its um, strategy for disability rights and works to be, together with uh, disabled persons organizations. It's time uh, to find ways how people with and without uh, disabilities can work together and uh, can, um, with the necessary support, achieve things uh, jointly. There are enough alternatives to the sheltered workshop system. We just have to adopt them politically and have to fund them. 
My name is Katrin Langensieben. I'm Green MEP and Associate uh, um, um, head of our group in the European uh, Parliament among the 704 um, MEPs. I'm the only female person with a disability. Um, the labor market uh, is one of my political topics. Uh, as a young person, I also uh, was uh, searching for um, um, a, a training uh, opportunity and I was uh, offered a place in a workshop. Now I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Wolfmeier. You have the floor. Please tell us about Austria. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Langensieben. I would like to welcome you on uh, my behalf in my own name. And uh, I'm fascinated that you should be uh, so interested in this topic. Before I start talking about the situation in Austria and in Styria, uh, I would uh, perhaps first like to turn to the European experience that I had at a former uh, president of the EASPD. Um, we do represent uh, member associations from 33 uh, European member states, and uh, I would like to remind you of some of the principles which I think um, should orient us with a view to future developments. First of all, Ms. Langensieben already mentioned it. You were talking about the, the inclusive labor market. But what we need uh, today, above all, is inclusive um, uh, values, I would say, um, especially after this um, corona crisis, everyone is talking about a restart, a reboot of the whole system. And what are the what are all these values that should be part and parcel of it? Sustainability, for example, and the integration, the inclusiveness of the entire society, really, of men, women, um, of all walks of life, nobody should be left behind. Uh, but still, we have to acknowledge that we do leave a lot of people behind nowadays. Uh, some of them feel quite isolated and are separated out of our society. Ms. Langensieben already mentioned that um, political and financial support is needed for this. Um, I do work in uh, Steiermark in Austria nowadays in an um, advisory uh, company uh, for uh, the political uh, sphere. What we can see uh, today is if you isolate people in a separated system, they are forever dependent on support, on help, and um, uh, Many international studies, uh, all the research points uh, to this. Um, it is uh, rather expensive also. So what do we need? Inclusive labor markets. But what does that particularly mean for all of us? It does mean that all citizens living in Europe should uh, be able to participate in the um, economy, in the economic life, and in work, in employment, and um, also live rather independently. Now, there are two avenues uh, that are open to us in Europe. There are certain states, oh, sorry, I forgot something. The European Union, and that is the new European Commission, um, has introduced new elements in the strategy for um, disabled persons, uh, and they might come in very useful, like, for example, the initiative for sustainable for a sustainable economy. And the other one is a, a plan for social economy. And the new commissioner for employment uh, um, said in a conference where I was present, that one third of the newly found companies are already social economy companies. And they do integrate uh, all those disadvantaged and uh, quite a few disabled persons in the uh, national economy. Now, the member states of the European Union utilize these possibilities in quite a different way. 
um, like for example, in the Netherlands, uh, all this uh, mm, topic is integrated in the Ministry for the Economy. And France has its own, oh, I'm sorry. I have to apologize. It's unbelievable the things that you ha that happened to you when you think you've switched everything off. Don't worry, don't worry. Oh, I'm so sorry, says Mr. Wolfmeier. Now it's definitely muted. Right. If we talk about employment for persons with a disability, I don't think we should be considering integrating them into a normal company. We should think about the more specific possibilities for them. There are services at hand that people with disabilities can use to facilitate their integration into the labor market. Um, we did a research about six, seven years ago to find out um, more about the sheltered workshops. And it was rather surprising for us that it is huge. Three million people in Europe, across Europe, work in those sheltered workshops, but um, they are completely um, differently organized. Uh, some of them get a bit of pocket money, some of the people employed in the sheltered services, um, sorry, uh, workshops get that. But in other countries, it's, diff it's very different. Uh, people receive a proper wage and they're also um, they also have a social in, uh, uh, security. What I would also like to mention in terms of the European landscape, um, I, was I was able to visit quite a, a few projects across Europe in the past three years, and it's very important to consider public procurement also. It sh public procurement should include a certain social conditionality because many of the social um, economic uh, companies um, employ uh, disadvantaged or disabled persons. And in all the member states where this is not properly regulated, you will find a situation where the disabled and disadvantaged persons are the first to lose their jobs when times get rough. I would like to now turn to a company which I co-founded more than 30 years ago in Eastern Styria. Uh, it's a very rural area uh, um, with borders to Slovenia, Slovakia and Hungary, and about 280,000 people live in this region, and we have about 80,000 companies in the region. What I can say today, this is a region that has uh, tremendously developed over the past 30 years. It's a very lively, a very vivid region, also in terms of the employment landscape. And it started with youth, working with youth, with children living in psychiatric institutions, for example. They were integrated into normal schools, for example. We never, we never considered how we should put people, lock them away in institutions. We always considered together with the families what was needed to make life possible for children within their normal uh, environment and their families. And that is how we created a very modern and up-to-date service providers network. We very often only consider the services that we offer. We really have to consider the whole system, I think, in order to make sure that someone who's in need can actually live in the community, in the family, and work well in a company. 
So the question you have to put all the time is what do these people need according to their uh, life, the, the conditions of their daily life uh, so that they can really um, go out and do so many things. Uh, and I think the services need to be tuned also not only to the disabled or the disadvantaged person, but also to the entire family and the community indeed, because it's not an isolated topic, the uh, disability. So we never seek for a place uh, in an institution, we always seek for a solution to keep that person at home in the family. And that is why we created this huge company with uh, services that are provided and um, a huge uh, number of services in all areas you can think of. And within that time frame, I would say since 1990, we were able to integrate about 6,000 persons into work in companies. Um, and I would like to perhaps share the secrets uh, of our success with you. One of the first um, differ differences we make is that you have to think of inclusiveness from the birth of a, uh, a disabled a child, somebody who's, who's learned um, to live in uh, sheltered uh, specialized schools or sheltered uh, uh, ch uh, child care facilities um, will never learn to live uh, independently. These persons will also be dependent, so will always be dependent throughout their life. So the inclusiveness, the integration starts with the birth. The second thing which is important is to support, to support the systems. I already mentioned this. Uh, we started with uh, families, working with families. We asked them what they needed in order to be able to manage their uh, daily life. Um, like, for example, uh, helping them psychologically also. Um, and very simple things, very simple services were offered to them, uh, things that are very often forgotten. And then we help them to transition from uh, keeping a child with a disability in the family and integrating it into kindergarten, then onwards to school, then onwards to some sort of uh, professional training and on to employment. And one of the important elements in all these different phases is to work closely with the persons concerned and to always use what these people can do, use their abilities, their possibilities, and not always remind them of what they cannot do. Medical di diagnostics, for example, are, are um, instrumental for finding out what somebody is able to do and what somebody is simply not able to achieve. Very important for uh, transitioning into employment is um, another initiative that we took, I think a rather unique initiative, um, that we've rolled out in Austria. It's um, what we call the youth coaching system. It's a system that we introduced um, for young people who have difficulties in uh, different uh, aspects of uh, coping with life. In the old days, uh, many young people just stayed at home. They didn't know where to go, what to do. Um, and now we have started to offer them internships, for example, to simply test and try what they like, what they would like to do, what they can do, so that they can then freely choose um, a, a kind of apprenticeship or a professional education that they would like to invest 
themselves in. It's very important to think of the practical work experience, the internship, as something that's not costly for a company and that can be um, stretched over a longer period of time in order to establish trust and confidence. Um, And then there's another element that I would like to mention for companies and for persons with disabilities, it's very important to have one uh, constant contact point. Uh, if they have a crisis, they need to be able to take up contact with someone that must be of a high quality and consistent, consistently available also. And then you have to be able to provide good examples. You can't expect from an authority that, um, uh, you, that companies, um, or as an authority, you cannot expect that uh, people uh, are employed with disabilities are employed in uh, companies if you don't employ them yourselves. Uh, so you also have to... Um, lead by example. I was very impressed by the Irish uh, example. The parliament had taken on 100 disabled persons in the parliament. And the Chance B group also has um, co-founded a social uh, company which helps, for example, elderly persons to stay at home and to uh, receive help and um, so that's a kind of of a service that we offer to the elderly who wish to stay at home uh, but need some help like for example taking their laundry to to the laundrette and other things or go shopping for them um, we think it's very important to also do a fair amount of lobbying and to have a good contact with uh, politicians to promote um, uh, living conditions for um, people with disabilities. Unfortunately, however, the law very often um, excludes uh, disabled persons from a regular employment um, situation. Uh, people with more than 50% of a disability um, uh, are not um, uh, well they 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 cannot make themselves available for the regular uh, labor market and that is something which we need to overcome thanks für diesen besuch in der steiermark thank you very much mr wolfmeier for this journey to uh, the steiermark to styria and uh, if I find the time, I'd like to go there and have a look at it. Uh, it was my plan to travel through the European member states and um, see things locally. But um, I think, uh, yes, I would still be able to, to do that. And now we're traveling to the north, to Ireland. And I'm uh, very glad that Aideen M. Hartney is with us, who is going to tell us how she sees things in her country, in Ireland. What about the um, transposition of the UN Disability Convention? Uh, there are also uh, as many uh, sheltered workshops, 300,000 um, in Ireland as in Germany, or what is different in Ireland? You have the floor. Thank you very much and good afternoon everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to, to join you today and congratulations on holding such a very interesting and timely event. Uh, I am the director of an organization called the National Disability Authority and just to provide some sense of, of what uh, our organization is. We are an advisory body to government. We have been established through legislation and our duty is to provide independent evidence informed advice on disability directly to to government, to all government ministers and their officials. Uh, we also have a role to promote universal design. 
which is the design and composition of the environment so that it can be accessed and used by everybody, regardless of whether they have a disability uh, or not. Uh, so uh, both these roles uh, are, are relevant uh, in some of our advice and work on employment. The Irish situation, it, it, it's, uh, it's very similar uh, to that across Europe, in fact, possibly a, a little worse. Uh, our statistics show that we have one of the most pronounced uh, employment gaps uh, for people with disabilities. So our most recent census in 2016 indicated that 36.5% uh, of people with a disability of working age were in employment. So that is lower than the EU average uh, and about half the rate of uh, persons without disability. Things are improving slowly. A greater numbers of people with disabilities are uh, finding employment and being retained in employment. But that is, I think, because our overall employment situation is improving rather than the fact that the, the gap is being closed. So that is the, the overall picture. Uh, with regard to sheltered work, uh, in Ireland, we had commenced work um, in before 2012 to, to look at the whole question of, of sheltered work because we were very conscious as a nation that this was not in line with uh, equality legislation that we have in place in Ireland. So that was a driver uh, for the organizations in charge of running sheltered workshops to, to take a look. Uh, their figures from about 2017 estimate that there were at that time still about 2,300 people in varying types of, of, of sheltered work arrangements, um, ranging from sheltered workshops to um, placements that were like work but were not um, being, being paid uh, the, the minimum wage um, things and things like that. And, and work is steadily ongoing to... Uh, can transition um, people from these set situations and these settings into uh, mainstream employment. There have been challenges uh, and then there have been good, good examples of success. So I, I will talk a little bit more about that uh, for over the next few minutes. Um, but some of it, what has the challenges that have been experienced are that uh, we are good in Ireland at having policies and strategies for addressing the problems uh, and we can often have challenges with implementation and we can have some very good examples of implementation at local level uh, by uh, single providers, um, by very motivated companies, by very motivated organisations. Uh, and where we struggle is to bring that to a national level where there's a standardized and consistent approach across the country. Um, but certainly the policy goal and the commitment of government is, is to ensure that everybody uh, can have, who wants to work, can have access to meaningful and mainstream employment. And to that end, we have uh, an overarching policy or strategy in Ireland, which is the Comprehensive Employment Strategy for People with Disabilities. And it's a 10 year strategy and it started in 2015. So 2024 will be its final year. But it recognized some of the um, issues that Mr. Wolfmeyer was highlighting that solving some employment challenges includes or requires a, a whole of life course uh, approach uh, right from birth through through to uh, somebody's working life and that also recognizes that there's more than one government department required to take leadership uh, and, and to take action in that regard so the comprehensive employment strategy was, was designed with that in mind so it sets out six priority areas of focus uh, and many government departments and, and public bodies that sit under them have commitments under those, under those priorities. 
so the first one is about building the skills and the capacity and independence for people with disabilities uh, to ensure they are qualified to work in the areas they wish to work in. Uh, and that starts at the very earliest stages through the education system. Um, then there's a priority about what supports somebody might need into work. And uh, one of the persistent things that uh, data shows us in Ireland is that one of the major challenges is access to public transport um, for, for people to actually get, get to their place of employment. Uh, accessible public transport uh, is very challenging, but, but that's just one of the areas that's covered under um, under that priority. Others of it is about vocational training and, and access to programmes like that. There's a priority that focuses on the financial incentives to take up employment, uh, because in Ireland, our benefit system is configured so that people can start drawing a disability benefit at the age of 16. And all the research shows that once somebody is on a, a benefit system for a, a protracted period of time, it becomes very difficult then for them to come back into mainstream employment. So there, there's a stream of work under the strategy to address that. There's a stream to deal with um, people who acquire a disability. In, in Ireland, uh, over 75% of people um, with a disability have acquired that disability while of working age. Um, so there are, needs to be dedicated strategies and policies uh, for supporting people to return to work after acquiring a disability. There is a priority about the need for all the different um, organizations and bodies to work together so that support is seamless so that somebody doesn't fall between stools as they move from one life stage to another and uh, so the importance of transitions there and then there's a priority all about engaging employers and that recognizes that whatever we do to uh, support people with disabilities to have the qualifications and the training uh, and the access to, to job opportunities, uh, it doesn't make much difference if the employers aren't themselves willing to, to take on uh, people with disabilities into their companies. So that's the overarching policy framework. Um, to return to the, the, the question of sheltered work, um, as I mentioned, that's um, in a process of transition itself at the moment. There is another policy about adult day services in Ireland. Uh, it's called New Directions. Uh, and the aim of that policy is to ensure that everybody who needs in more intensive support um, can be supported to live a, a, as inclusive a life in the community as is possible. And it means a move away from segregated settings into disp dispersed settings within the community. So from days of, of sheltered workshops or, or sheltered um, day service locations, now hubs, individual smaller hubs are being set up within local communities and maybe a maximum of 12 people would be using those hubs so that the services and the supports can be much more personalized um, and integrated in the community. So there are a number of supports under that policy. That policy commits to delivering a number of supports for people with disabilities, but two of them are about accessing training or education or vocational programs uh, and work opportunities. There have been some challenges with rolling out that particular policy. Uh, some of it is to do with the amount of funding that's available to establish these hubs and provide supports on a more individualized level. Uh, and very much these were services that were impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, for a large portion of 2020, service locations closed. Uh, so people with disabilities no longer had the, were, were no longer able to access these hubs and the supports that were being provided in them. And then by that reason, sometimes people were losing the skills and independence that they had built up uh, over the last number of years. And um, so we know that there's going to be a challenge in, in supporting people to regain some of that lost ground after the pandemic. There have been a, a few innovative ways of, of um, improving employment outcomes for people with disabilities in Ireland that I, I thought I might just highlight. 
But again, I would say at the outset, these are individual programs or initiatives and they haven't yet been scaled to, to national level. So uh, Mr. Wolfmeyer mentioned the um, houses of government uh, recruiting people with disabilities. This was a specific internship program that was started uh, and piloted in the houses of the Oireachtas, that's the, the Irish uh, houses of government and of parliament. Um, and it took that uh, holistic approach because it combined the, the internship, the job placement with on the job support and with uh, education and training. So the young people selected would attend for some training and education for one part of the day, and then they would be supported in their placement uh, across the houses of government um, for, for the other part of the day. Uh, and this would run for the internship program duration, which was a number of months. Uh, and people were placed in a very wide variety uh, of job situations. Some of it was clerical work. Uh, some of it was uh, supporting the catering um, businesses within the houses of government. Um, so a very wide range of activities. Uh, and what they have, they've taken in a number of groups of, of interns over the last two years. And what they are now starting to do is place people from that program into permanent employment. Uh, so that has been very successful, although the numbers are still very small. But what they are doing now is they're showcasing that approach and hoping to roll it acro out across the, the wider public sector. Another initiative is uh, a program called the Ability Program. This is part funded through uh, ESF funding from the EU and, and matched funding from the Irish government. Uh, and it funds 27 different programs across Ireland to test approaches to how you would move people with disabilities closer to the labour market. So each different ability programme is taking a different approach. Some of them are focusing on specific disabilities. Some of them are focusing on the education and training side. Some of them are focusing on the job placement side uh, or the job coaching side. Um, so they're testing different um, practices. And the idea is to capture which practices are working particularly well uh, so that there might be learning to scale that up for for the country as a whole one of the things um that it might not sound very innovative but it, it was a a big change for uh, the provider of our and uh, the funder of our adult day services which is the, the health service executive in ireland um in 2018 they piloted uh, an approach that allowed young people to defer entry into uh, an adult day service for one year. So traditionally, people would move from special education probably directly into an adult day service place. Um, and this might not always have been necessary. People would have had the skills or the interest to seek employment or to seek other education opportunities, but they were very afraid of losing support uh, if they didn't take up a, a day service place when it was offered to them, they were worried that if something didn't work out, they wouldn't have the funding uh, available to them in the future to go back into a day service place. So the health service executive agreed to pilot deferral um, for a, a period of year to allow people go off and, and test and try and explore new options, just as anyone in the population has, has those opportunities to try new things on, on school leaving. So in 2018, they had 51 people who wanted to try deferring and only seven of those uh, returned at the end of the year to take up the day service place. Uh, and in 2019, there were 73 deferrals and only four returned. Uh, so the hope is that that approach will uh, be able to continue into the longer term. There's also been work um, to uh, remove some of the financial disincentives uh, and to uh, encourage people uh, to take up employment while retaining some of their benefits, uh, which is showing some positive outcomes, al although it is at early stages. Um, there's a program through uh, our enterprise board that is designated to support people with disabilities into entrepreneurship, uh, and that is just at its, its 
starting stages at the moment, but it's modeled on a similar program for supporting female entrepreneurs. Um, so the, the, the organization in question are, are very invested in having a similar program for, for this group because they recognize uh, that there's very valuable talent pool to, to be tapped there. And just at the end of the la last year, the government funded uh, an employer support initiative called Employers for Change. And the idea here is to provide a dedicated service uh, for employers to provide advice and information to them um, on, on how uh, and what to do when employing somebody with a disability. Because all our research has shown is that employers have a fear factor that is stopping them from taking that step. Uh, and this service now will provide uh, peer support and advice to employers and uh, so speaking the business language to them uh, rather than the advocacy language because that has been shown to to uh, have more impact. Uh, I'm very conscious of time so I'll just mention two other um, things that are underway in the Irish landscape at the moment. Um, my own organisation the NDA is doing some work with the OECD to research uh, what effective approaches to employer engagement look like across uh, the OECD. And again, that's to capture learning from other jurisdictions uh, to show what's possible for employers to do, but also how the government can support employers and therefore encourage and, and drive them uh, to employ people with disabilities in greater numbers. Uh, and also just at the end of 2019, um, a number of groups rolled out a reasonable accommodations passport. Uh, and this was a way of supporting people with disabilities to capture what accommodations they might need and how to advocate for those accommodations in the workplace. And they could bring that from workplace to workplace uh, rather than having to explain or advocate for themselves uh, or, um, uh, at, at the start. Uh, and I think one of the crucial reasons for the success of this passport is that it has been uh, driven by the trade unions and employer bodies uh, as well. Um, rather than uh, only through disability organisations. So that has given it more mainstream um, impact. I suppose I would just say that the, the pandemic obviously means that some of these initiatives that started towards the end of 2019 haven't had the opportunity to be fully tested uh, or evaluated. So some of the outcomes have been somewhat delayed. Uh, and part of our own role is to advise government that it's vital that people with disabilities are represented and planned for uh, in the pandemic recovery uh, so that, uh, that that lost ground can be made up. Um, and I'll also just mention one final thing, which is that we have a minimum target uh, for the employment of people with disabilities in the public sector in Ireland. Uh, at the moment, that is that 3% of all public sector employees should be people with disabilities. The National Disability Authority has the duty to monitor that, um, monitor compliance with that target. Uh, and by and large, it is being met. Uh, however, it's possibly not a very ambitious target. And the government has committed to increasing the minimum to 6% by 2024. So we're working closely across the public sector to help advise people on how they might achieve that increased target uh, over time. Uh, but it certainly has been uh, a mechanism for, for uh, driving a focus in the public sector uh, on how people with disabilities can be employed in greater numbers. Uh, so I'll close there. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Hartney. Uh, that was an in, a very interesting um, report on the situation in Ireland. And I would now like to pass the floor to Mr. Servilla and to Mr. de Kock. Uh, you are from Spain and Belgium, and I'm sure that you will be reporting on your work. Mr. Servilla, I think you wanted to start. Uh, in, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Katrina, and of course, all, all the speakers. Um, 
you set the bar very high so that's the problem of being at the end of the panel that you need to really maintain the quality of of the speeches so it's quite quite a challenge um let us first introduce ourselves and, and the organization that we represent here today we are uh intervening today on behalf of the dwise network which is a a network that were, was launched back in 2018 if i if i remember correctly um sponsored by the onthe foundation which is a foundation that belongs to the onthe social group uh which is an organization promoting the right of persons with disabilities in spain co-funded by the, the ESF uh, back then, and that gathered together six um, companies or organizations very active in the social economy and employing a high number of persons with disabilities, many of them using uh, the models of, uh, of shelter employment. Why were we born? Well, I think, uh, Mr. Wolfmeyer, you already gave, gave a hint at the beginning of, of, uh, of today's panel which is the complete disparity of models and, of course, standards and qualities of uh, employment for persons with disabilities across the European Union. And what we uh, have tasked ourselves with is really to try to see how can we define good quality standards for employment of persons with disabilities in shelter employment, amongst others, that fulfill or comply perfectly with uh, all the legal obligations uh, stemming from the UN Convention, uh, all the objectives of the of the disability strategy, and and so on. So let's all. I want to be crystal crystal clear. What we support is uh, employment for persons with disabilities, or what we look into is employment of persons with disabilities that ensure all types of uh, guarantees of, of quality, minimum wages, uh, representation rights, and of course the freedom of the person to uh, transition to from, from shelter employment to open labor market. Um, one of the, again, one of the reasons that, that we, we, we created this, this network, which was also somehow reflected in the, in the European disability strategy, was to really dive into the reality of member states and try to extract good practices and, and, and models, and then try to craft um, the policy recommendations and, and, and proposals and standards that will help um, the policymakers like uh, like uh, Katrin here, but the rest of uh, officials from the European Commission and the European Parliament and so on, to make sure that policies allow for a diversity of models of employment, but regardless of the model, that those uh, employment uh, facilities or those employment uh, situations obey by the highest standards. Because I think we are all here in the same uh, in the same boat in trying to ensure that uh, persons with disabilities enjoy of absolutely equal opportunities and equal conditions of um, of employment. So this is a bit the light motive. This is a bit the, the objective of the of the DYS uh, network. We we are again uh, a, a partnership of six uh, national partners. They include the Onthe Foundation from, from Spain, Ape France Handicap from, from France, Cedris from the Netherlands, the Madvec Group, which is here represented by, by, by Steph, Somhal from Sweden, and Sips from, from Slovenia. Um, our work doesn't stop just in the, in, at the member state level. We have also very close uh, partnerships and relationships with the EPR the European Platform for Rehabilitation, the ESPD, which many of you know, especially uh, Mr. Bosmaya, since uh, you were president of, of the association. And we also work very, very closely with the European Disability Forum, obviously, but also with uh, Workability International and International Labour Organization. So we we really want to try to get all the information that we can from all sides at the national and the European level and the international level to then make sure that we can really see where the gaps are, where the problems are, and where also the opportunities are. So we are focused on on the model of the of the social economy that many of the previous speakers already uh, referred to, because we believe that um, it is a model on by itself that needs support and needs recognition and needs standards. Um, 
and that it can be further uh, shaped and, and supported to then compete uh, or operate in, 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 in the market and, of course, stress its value as all the, the profits and all the the revenues that they can they can generate can be reinvested back into into uh, society in this case back into the for the benefit of uh, of persons with uh, with disabilities in our very young uh, lifespan because and the network is barely uh, two two and a half years old we've we have put together a series of of recommendations uh, for for policymakers to hopefully embrace and, and, and use as, as inspiration. We have also traveled across uh, member states to, to really see the reality of, of things. We can't, of course, with our uh, with the invaluable input from, from our members like Steph and, 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 and the others, but we also wanted to see by, them, by ourselves how these companies um, operate. And uh, it's all information that you can, by the way, find uh, publicly available in, in our website. And we also try to uh, figure already start trying to figure out how can we define this type of employment and how can we really make it work and how can we then export uh, these best practices and 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 we did um, a comparative report a comparative study between the different models to really see what the key assets are and of course the the point about the the social economy uh, came up uh, because again, it, it is an asset that has to be has to be further um, highlight, highlighted, but um, we also saw the gaps, and the gaps are in the lack of, um, say, consideration of this type of employment in 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 the specific legislation. And now, like uh, Catherine knows, we are we even propose uh, recommendations to be taken into account in very specific policy files. Now, the European Parliament is debating the commission's proposal uh, on minimum wages and we think that uh, this uh, general framework for minimum wages should be um, should also be applicable to, to shelter employment because there's no reason why shelter employment should go under uh, under these these uh, frameworks but um, more importantly there is uh, the need to define or to to, to build these standards that this type of employment is to obey with to make sure that we don't find ourselves in absolutely uh, despicable situations of uh, employment that does not fulfill uh, well wage uh, minimum wages uh, union rights uh, information for workers and, and and so on so that that completely disregards article 27 of the UN, uncrpd so this is where we're we're working towards um, it is not uh, more complicated than, again, promoting on the one hand uh, that all employment needs to be of quality employment, and uh, on the other hand, trying to stress the value of uh, social economy organizations in, uh, well, giving back to society on the, on the one hand, but also um, in providing uh, opportunities for employment opportunities for persons with with disabilities, one of the key findings um, of our of one of our studies was that I think it, except for for in the case of uh, of Sweden, uh, our partner uh, Samhal, there's low transition rates uh, from shelter to the open labor market reported in in the different markets. Amongst others, uh, due to the difficulties that the persons with disabilities may face when entering or retaining employment in, uh, we call it the mainstream labor market or the open uh, labor market, which then also led us to, to believe that in some cases, not always, but in some in some cases, the work uh, opportunities that are provided by uh, social enterprises or social economy enterprises could be the only option that persons with disabilities can, can, can enjoy. Again, this is by no means a reason to uh, worsen the quality of the employment. It's not because uh, it might be uh, one of the, of the few options that uh, would ever justify uh, underpayments or back, bad working conditions and, and, and so on. But we also want to stress that these kind of models, the, the social economy models are not just a last resort measure. 
uh, I think we think that there are entities that have their own um, right of, of, of existence. And uh, in the case of, uh, of our members, have also proven uh, their their value on in in not just generating these employment opportunities for persons with disabilities, but also in their investment of uh, of uh, of uh, but investment back into into society. Um, for us, again, uh, I think uh, Mr. Falsmeyer, you, you mentioned also earlier the upcoming uh, social economy action plan that we are of course very much looking forward to and to contribute. Um, hoping to contribute more to the uh, the different strategies that stem from the application of the European pillar of social rights, the minimum wage directive, state aid, and, 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 and so on. So we would, we really want to stress, again, the value of, uh, of uh, employment from, from the social economy uh, sector, and we'll always welcome um, any contributions or any questions from, from you. And maybe I will now transition myself from the very theoretical to the real life and practical aspect of things. So Steph, I don't know if you want to add anything into my, my intervention. Yes, thanks, uh, Louise, and also thanks to the other speakers. It was a uh, very uh, interesting and always uh, very valuable to exchange uh, inspiring practices. Um, I will maybe um, explain a little bit the situation in, uh, in Flanders. Um, uh, I myself, I am uh, maybe quickly, I'm a board member of ESPD, uh, the, the Umbrella Federation of Service Providers. Um, I'm also the acting president of EEE, also an umbrella federation of Equal Employment Europe. We are representing uh, five countries, um, and five organizations in those countries who are um, occupied with the employment of people with, uh, with disabilities. And uh, for myself, uh, my job is. Uh, Senior advisor at Group Matwerk. And what is Group Matwerk? Um, you're also an umbrella federation of what we call in Flanders custom work companies. Uh, we are representing uh, 56 custom work companies. And custom work companies are employing mainly people with, with disabilities. Or 56 custom work companies are employing uh, 22,000 people, and about 80% of them, so let's say um, 17,000, 518,000 people, are people with, uh, with disabilities and mainly intellectual uh, disability. What is uh, maybe specific for, for Flanders is that um, our competent minister is not a minister of. Uh, of disabilities, no, since 2008, we made a switch in the idea of, of uh, inclusion towards a new minister and the Minister of Social Economy and Work, which is very important from the perspective of the inclusion ID. Um, and as a consequence, since 2008, also uh, persons with a disability who were looking for a job, they did not, um, they, they made a switch instead of going to a special agency for people with disabilities uh, to help them, supporting them in, in, uh, in their way to a job, they go to the same and only employment office, same office as for people without disabilities. And also this fits in the, in the inclusion ID and it's the, the one and only employment office in Flanders who decides and who does an assessment on, on what kind of support you can get. And for example, if you are if you have uh, quite severe disabilities, they can get you some support um, to uh, take your backpack with support uh, to a custom work uh, company. Um, important there is that the fact that um, our employment office gives the right to persons with disabilities to work to a custom work company. They can also go to a regular uh, company. Our custom work companies. Previously, they were, they were uh, the sheltered workshops, but now we are a custom work company since, uh, since two years. We have a new regulation and we are custom work companies. These are all not-for-profit uh, companies, which means that we cannot have share, shareholders, for example. Every profit that we make must return to the custom work uh, company or to the uh, employees, to the staff, to the workers. There are also private organizations, which means that we can go bankrupt. Yeah? It is a possibility. Uh, 
unfortunately, sometimes it, it happens. It, it has happened in, in the past. But then we um, try to organize some uh, some mergers to avoid that people with disabilities um, get fired. And this works in, in practice. What differs um, between uh, custom work companies and regular companies, that our custom work companies, they do not develop firstly a, a job profile and then you, they will look for the, for the best person. No, we firstly engage people and especially people with disabilities. And in a second stage, we look for the best suitable tasks and activities for those persons. We try to train them, we try to adapt the, uh, the workplace, and then we make a, a job match uh, for them. Um, from um, an employment law perspective, all our employees, even the persons with the most severe disabilities in our custom work companies, they are considered as real employees. Yeah? So everyone gets at least the official minimum wage, which is in Flanders about 1,600 gross, and I think about 1,300 and something uh, net wage. That's the minimum wage in Belgium, and everyone gets at least this minimum wage. We have also our own joint committee in Flanders for custom work companies, uh, like I think also in, in Germany, who have um, collective labor agreements per, per sector. Uh, in Belgium, it's, it's the same. We have for, for the banks, we have separate negotiations for collective uh, labor agreements in, in the metal sector and so on. Uh, and we have our own collective labor agreements, especially for custom work uh, companies. And this uh, are, um, are uh, obliged for everyone who is working in custom work companies uh, in, in Flanders. Um, what is important is being a private company, um, about 50%, it's a little bit less than 50% from our uh, revenues uh, are generated by subsidies. Uh, um, when you have 100% uh, uh, turnover, so more than 50% is generated by commercial uh, activities. Um, so we are quite close to the, uh, to the uh, regular uh, economy because that are our clients. And we make, we made, uh, I think, three years ago, um, we did a, an, a, little, um, a little research and what, uh, what was the result that about uh, in one province we did, we did this exercise and about 50% of all industrial companies are working together with custom work companies. And one of, um, of our very important way to work together with them and is also very important for the people with disabilities is the principle or the model of enclaves. And what does this mean? Uh, that people um, or workers with a disability on the payroll of uh, custom work companies are working on the premises of the client. Uh, they are coached by our own job coaches. They are still on the payroll of custom work companies, but day by day, they are working on the premises of the client. And this is very important for the people with, with disabilities because in their perspective, it is like they are working for the client. For example, a big client is, is Nike and the sport uh, mark. Um, I think about, well, a lot of people are, are working day by day on their premises. And for, for the people with disabilities, it is like they are working for, for Nike. They are still on our payroll and, and guided and coached and supported by our people, by our social assistant, by our job coaches and so on. But they are working day by day on the premises of the client. And we have a lot of other examples uh, of what we call them uh, enclaves. Um, maybe um, a last point that is um, what we noticed uh, also when we engage people. Um, but also in, in other um, sectors where people with disabilities um, are working, that there exist a lot of instruments to measure the competences of people with disabilities and especially people with intellectual disabilities, but there was no uh, validated instrument to measure the work aspirations of people with disabilities and especially intellectual disabilities not in Belgium and not in other countries. I mean by validated, validated by uh, in a scientific um, so, uh, occupational psychology way. Eh? This does not exist, which is amazing. Uh, it, is, it is existing uh, 
instruments and validated instruments for, for valid people, but not for people with mainly intellectual disabilities. And that's what we are developing now since, since two years, and we will finish it uh, in the month of, of September, an official scientific instrument to measure the work aspirations of people with disabilities and especially intellectual uh, disabilities. Uh, and in that way, we hope to contribute to um, um, bridging the gap. The project is called uh, Bridging Severe Disabilities at, at Work, to bridging the gap between the people with disabilities and especially their aspirations regarding work and their future uh, employment. Um, I think that's, that's most important at the moment, but um, maybe some questions will, will rise uh, later on in, uh, during this speech. Uh, this Ganz herzlichen Dank, Herr de Kock. Thank you very much, Mr. de Kock, for your very interesting insights um, in your system and the activities. Um, and we've um, looked across Europe a little bit, and now it's the turn of our uh, participants uh, in the Q&A section, we already have a few questions piling up and you can definitely uh, send in your comments. Uh, if you don't have a question, comments are also welcome, of course. Mm, we don't want any uh, huge um, uh, lengthy contributions don't uh, give us the whole story of your life. Uh, but if you do have some concrete examples, then we would be very happy if you shared them with us. And I shall now have a look at um, what we have. We have uh, someone who's been asking for the floor a hand uh, that I can see that indicates that someone wants to speak. Can you please activate that participant? Yes, you may now um, put your question. Yeah, my name is Christiane Hagen. My name is Christiane Hagen. I live in Germany and I am a representative, have been a representative for two years for um, an association that provides life assistance. And I do um, uh, work in uh, companies uh, that uh, um, receive uh, life assistance. I think uh, that we have very little inclusion present um, in daily life. There are still quite a few barriers and obstacles, like, for example, access to transport. Some of the buses, for example, are um, not large enough. Nowadays, uh, in the era of the pandemic, uh, we really have to um, be, we, we have to share a bus with eight passengers, so uh, we cannot keep the distance. Um, and then there's another thing. I think we have very little say in decisions. Um, everybody turns around to us and, to, and says, but you do have uh, some work, so you better not complain. It's very difficult for us to participate in decision-taking. 
but of course i mean uh, i can stop working if uh, if i like that wouldn't be a problem i would be provided for but it's not what i want to do i would like to uh, continue being employed Catherine is the one who's motivated me to simply carry on to to not give up and to to try and uh, have my say thank you and uh, uh, i am also one of the chairpersons of my group and i'm really in interested in learning about the examples uh, from abroad. Uh, I visited Mallorca in the 80s, for example, and I wonder whether inclusion has moved any, any forward uh, on the island of Mallorca in Spain, and or whether you have a situation where disabled persons are not really very welcome, uh, where they feel um, that they shouldn't be there. And uh, my experience has not been very positive throughout. And I think that uh, Corona has uh, created uh, um, additional uh, obstacles for us. And I would also like to know about Austria, because I have visited uh, Austria several times, uh, not quite as intensively as Spain and, um, and uh, Switzerland. Very good. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for your question. I think I'll collect uh, questions. I do see two, uh, two other hands uh, that are raised. And the first question was what the situation in Austria and in Spain is uh, with a view to uh, the transposition and whether activists uh, um, and representatives of disabled persons uh, have a say. And I would like to ask you to unmute uh, the mic of Ms. Nacke. My name is Carola Nacke. I'm also from Germany. I have a son who, is who has multiple handicaps and he works in a sheltered workshop. Uh, and I realized um, with him that uh, there are so many people working there who definitely are given opportunities on what we would call the second labor market. And I think it's fascinating to hear um, what sort of uh, progress uh, you've made in other European countries uh, that you have an objective of employing three to six percent of disabled persons in public administration that uh, that would be a dream situation i think uh, uh, over here thank you very much um, i'm fascinated by this webinar Thank you very much for your comment. And now I would like to turn to the next speaker. Hello, here is Nancy Frind. Yeah, hi, I am Nancy Frind from um, Germany, from Erfurt. I was uh, pointed to this uh, uh, webinar and I can uh, assure you that it is very difficult to transit from a, such a sheltered workshop to the first labor market. Uh, I um, am employed in such a workshop myself. It's very difficult to find the support. Um, 
and to be coached because many people don't have um, a school leaving certificate, for example. They don't have uh, um, a professional uh, training certificate. It's very, very difficult for us if we can't provide the certificates and nobody wants to employ us. Uh, I do have a certificate. Um, for job training, but it's not uh, really valued very highly. So it is difficult. Even if you want to move up, uh, you cannot. Uh, I don't even receive 200 euros uh, a month for working almost eight hours a day, um, every day. And I think that is just impossible uh, to accept over, a long, over the long term. So I think uh, something must uh, must move, uh, m must happen uh, to integrate as much better. Mm. Uh, I've met Katrin a few weeks ago um, and I informed her about that situation. We need a lot of support uh, as people being employed in those workshops. Um, I, I didn't even know three years ago that uh, there is a possibility to to find employment for a disabled person. But I would like to thank you very much for your webinar. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, who else? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Claudia Casamento. I work in a workshop with people with uh, disabilities, and I would like to ask Ms. Langensiepen, um, what do you think about uh, all those uh, outplacement services for disabled persons, for integrating them in the, to the mainstream labor market? I'm sure that you're aware of all these projects and models and concepts. And um, what do you think about them? Um, are there any... Um, yeah, any, any, is there any need to, to improve the situation any further? What, what is your take on that? Because it, it's also interesting, of course, to compare that with the situation in Europe. Thanks very much. I would like to, I think there's still one more person asking for the floor. I'm also mindful of the time. Um, so, uh, because we also have some written questions to take up, I do have two further requests for the floor. Um, and Robert Neuhauser is my name. I, I work in the um, integration service in Bavaria, and I have to... Um, tell you that we have uh, established uh, a very close cooperation with the workshops in Bavaria and that we have uh, tried to find uh, tailor-made solutions for everyone uh, quite successfully, I would dare say. So what we said was that you simply have to try, to test and try whether a certain um, a project is viable, whether a way out of the workshop is possible by offering internships, for example, placements and so on. But I think um, one question um, is still uh, is uh, unanswered. Uh, I think we tried to um, bridge um, uh, the uh, first labor, well, the, the, the divide between the first labor market and the sheltered labor market uh, by offering projects, but um, to very little avail. I mean, we, we haven't quite succeeded. So what else is needed to achieve the goal? Thanks very much. And I would now like to... Um, take up the questions. Um, the 
uh, school leaving certificates, the, the non-availability of uh, professional certificates, uh, uh, for example, it, that is uh, portrayed as an obstacle for being integrated into the labor market. Uh, then all these other concepts, uh, have Wolfmeier, uh, Mr. Wolfmeier, I think you would like to reply to those questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Langensiepen. And I would like to thank uh, all these colleagues for their interesting questions and uh, contributions. Um, uh, I would like to uh, perhaps turn to all those who raised uh, questions from Germany. The whole system must be constructed in such a way that uh, persons with disabilities um, be matched with uh, employment opportunities and not be put in uh, those sheltered workshops. So if you look at the young people of today, they should not be obliged to enter such a sheltered workshop. Um, and I think we need um, to integrate that orientation into the educational system because we have specialized education, specialized schooling for disabled persons. And I think that is a, a wrong approach. I think uh, the whole system, the whole education system and professional training system must um, facilitate our integration into the labor market full stop and not into a special workplace. Uh, and I think um, that is something that we really need to correct. We need to change the focus in the system. And then, of course, if everything is geared to proper employment, then um, the, the budget for labor will also be shaped uh, accordingly. But if... Uh, the, the budget is constructed in such a way or composed in such a way where really your place is in a sheltered uh, workshop, uh, that's very different. Um, and the first uh, lady who asked for the floor uh, talked about uh, the situation in the uh, transport service um, where, for example, you cannot keep the distance uh, under corona conditions. Why do you need a specialized transport service? And that is the first question you should ask. Normally, the public, uh, public transport providers should make sure that you can take the public transport like everybody else. So a specialized transport service is already the first step to discrimination or to separating you out from of the society. And I think that uh, that is um, very unfortunate. Well, uh, these will be my my first reactions, um, or perhaps um, mm, uh, my message to you: the system must be geared to finding work and not to sh to sheltered workshops. I don't see anyone else wishing to react uh, amongst the presenters, and I think we may turn just as well to the written questions uh, that were uploaded. I would like to read the first. Are there any international studies available on the labor market situation? That's uh, one of the questions. Then another question, working in Eastern Styria, uh, uh, even as a person who uh, has less than 50% of uh, work capacity. That's a question to Mr. Wolfmeier. Then uh, the, uh, the next question, is it true? Now I've lost the question, I'm afraid, uh, that only in Germany and Austria. Um, no minimum wage is paid to people working in those uh, sheltered employment situations. 
then uh, yet another question zamhol from sweden was mentioned um, uh, could you perhaps uh, add some further information on zamhol is that a positive uh, example uh, that's the question and i would like to uh, pass uh, the question to our speakers. I think Louis mentioned Zamhorn and Steph can perhaps answer that, but also Styria uh, for Mr. Wolfmeier. Who would like to go first? Yeah, you can. Well, I can start. Uh, talking about the international studies, there aren't really any uh, good international studies available, I'm afraid. Uh, it's very difficult to compare. Uh, I have undertaken a lot of study trips myself, and you have to uh, bring your own questions, but you can't compare the systems. And the difficulty is also the terminology. Um, first of all, the first difficulty is the numbers, of course, uh, but because I'm quite certain that not even the employment um, the figures are right, uh, because the criteria for employment of disabled persons are not uniform or harmonized in Europe. Uh, but of course, uh, studies are undertaken. Again, there's one on inclusive uh, companies 2020 plus that was undertaken in Austria. Uh, we finished that uh, uh, study last year and we integrate we integrated examples from six countries asking whether inclusive companies are a good concept. And if you have a concrete question for such a study, then you can compare the situation. In chance B, um, we do have people with less than 50% um, capacity to work, but some of these people only receive something like a pocket money because uh, these people are not s sure and certain that they can stay for about 10 years in employment uh, and they would not even be accepted by the employment uh, services uh, for further services for the job placement. Um, so that's a very special situation, but uh, definitely chance B is oriented towards the general labor market. So these 6,000 people that I mentioned in my first uh, presentation is people that uh, were um, integrated into the uh, mainstream labor market, and some of them with less than 50% capacity to work. Germany and Austria do have the sector with uh, which only pays pocket money and not a minimum wage, but we also have that in Sweden, in Finland, uh, in um, uh, communal uh, workshops, for example. Uh, but that's not really very telling. In many countries, you have a sort of daycare system in place where you do not work. But in Germany and in Austria, this is always the case because heavily disabled persons in um, in Austria and in Germany uh, are occupied with something, but they don't really work in the wor uh, sheltered workshops. And then there's another question, mm, statistics, numbers, studies. Uh, in my report, I also asked uh, for uh, the collection of such data, because otherwise uh, people say, well, I have heard and I have uh, read and so on, uh, but uh, that's not really a hard evidence or hard facts, and you can't really work on that basis. Um, and then uh, in the chat, uh, there was also the question about Zamhall, the, the Swedish model. Uh, and it's sometimes singled out as, as being something special. Uh, is that an idea for other countries too? 
Um, do we need a system offered by the state? We were also talking about uh, social economy companies. Um, what uh, can we compare with Samhol? Is it a state institution? What, what's your take on that, uh, Luis? Luis, perhaps you could go first. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and for, for full transparency, Sam Hall is, is a full member of our of our network. Um, and I think that already uh, you know, pushed me to say that I think it is it could be seen in many, many ways as a, as a good practice. Again, and I think that uh, Herr Wolfmeier already mentioned that it is very difficult to compare models to models because markets are different, conditions are different, traditions are different, and and so on. Uh, for those who, who want, we have a full case study on on some whole. Maybe Catherine, I can send it to you, and you can distribute it to to those who are participating uh, here. It's, it's quite a, a detailed uh, study on their model that we undertook. Uh, at the end of 2019, beginning of, uh, of 2020, especially looking at some of the specificities of, of their model that has had to do with um, the cooperation between shared employment and open labor uh, employment and uh, state and social economy enterprises with uh, uh, com conventional enterprises. Uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't make it because I was on parental leave, but my colleagues went to see their facilities uh, that they will have with uh, with IKEA and so on, and they are quite uh, quite impressive, especially again on this uh, model of, of transition between shelter employment from the social economy to the open labor employment. Uh, I I completely agree on the lack of um, uh, the, the problem that it is that the lack of common indicators, common figures, common comparable criteria, um, because. We need to take into account the, the specificities of each model, but at the same time, we need solutions that work for everybody. And without those um, those criteria, without those studies, it is very difficult to then really propose uh, solutions that will ensure uh, that the benefits of, of the social economy, of shelter employment, of the open labor employment, and so on, are, are reaped. So, uh, if if we can help, we have with our uh, research capacity or with putting our members together in providing this kind of comparable information will be more more than happy to to do so um i also saw i think on on, on the chat a question that was addressed to me by frau deutschleder uh, from uca about inclusive companies uh for us all models are good models as long as they are good for persons with disabilities, uh, social economy models, open labor models, and 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 so on. So, it is. I, I don't think that the debate should be around which one is better. It should be about the quality of employment. Uh, and without that, I think there's no really purpose in 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 in. in having some kind of artificial dichotomy between open labor for profit, not for profit, social economy, and 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 whatnot. And this is what we are actually promoting. We're promoting these guarantees that would ensure that from a policy and a regulatory point of view, employment of persons with disabilities obey by, again, minimum wage, participation, representation, involvement, uh, where possible freedom of the person to, to transition from one to the other and, and back to the original one and, 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 and so on. Um, so, this is, uh, it was mentioned that the models that only pay pocket money uh, to persons with disabilities and, and so on. For us, it should all be put uh, at, uh, at the same level, obviously. And this is what we are trying to do with a very specific piece of legislation. Uh, from the DYS network's perspective, of course, we're diving in great detail into the social economy model, because this is the remit of, of the network that we have put, uh, that we have put together. Uh, we see an, an, a, a lot of added value in this uh, social economy model that uh, Steph elaborated uh, elaborated on, but that does not mean that we're opposed to others. Uh, I think again, it is a question of uh, ensuring the the quality of uh, of the employment uh, through public companies, private companies, again, social economy and or not. From the DYS networks perspective, we are providing uh, recommendations for the recognition of the social economy model because again we think that it, it works and it can add value 
with uh, this uh, idea of reinvesting back into into society um, and uh, yeah but open of course to, to cooperate and to hear all solutions that will put an end to uh, some bad practices that we understand exist a bit everywhere of uh, uh, shelter workshops that don't pay enough salaries uh, that don't offer safe working conditions that uh, do not contribute to the active inclusion of persons with disabilities and and so on so again I always taking the uh, provisions of article 27 as as, as our, our guiding principles and trying to move policy forward to to make sure that it's fully respected Herzlichen Dank. Weitere Statements? Dann würde ich nämlich noch ein paar Fragen. Thank you very much. Uh, there are no further statements. I'm going to read out more questions. But I see uh, Mr. Wolfmeier wants the floor. Yeah. And then Stefan. Yes, thank you. We were talking a lot about the social economy model, and I'd like to explain what it is, because I believe many of the participants uh, don't know that. Social economy enterprises, according to the European definition, are enterprises with a societal objective, uh, which on top uh, uh, use uh, innovative democratic forms of enterprises in which uh, benefits or profits are not um, given out to private shareholders, are not issued to private shareholders, but remain largely inside the company and um, you participate in uh, social um, tenders with social criteria and in order to be able to participate in such uh, tenders uh, you have uh, an occupation or a workforce of at least 30 percent persons uh, from disadvantaged groups and in such a case such a company such an enterprise can participate and win in such a public tender this is a very uh, huge uh, topic i um, think the social enterprise model is a very good one um, if you have a look uh, at austria which is the country i know best i think in germany is probably 10 times as big uh, 44 billion euros per year are tendered in austria france uh, already um, said that 10 percent of uh, public tenders have to be uh, awarded according to social criteria and uh, this means that this can really be a push economically for the social sector and also for employment in the sector and then uh, something else uh, briefly as to the somehow model i'm an advocate of small structures uh, namely of ngos the civil society i believe has always had the capacity to do something at the local and regional level uh, to um, respond uh, to special needs, uh, local needs, and to find the right answers. But for this, we need an innovation framework. Austria is a good example in this uh, respect. Uh, um, we um, had an action three, uh, 30 years ago um, which helped uh, to uh, establish uh, tailor-made companies so that socially disadvantaged uh, persons uh, uh, can find their place uh, at the labor market. Just the, the, our uh, Chance B group is uh, one of those uh, companies which started then and still exist. So if we can um, uh, adopt the right framework, we can really find tailor-made uh, solutions for the regions in the regions. Thank you very much. Uh, Steph de Kock, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, no, uh, I would like to add that indeed about the, the figures, uh, uh, Catherine, this is very important. Uh, I, According to me, the most recent figures about the employment of people with disabilities in the different European countries date from 2011 from Eurostat. So these figures are not really up to date. Mm -hmm. So we, we really need an up to date research for uh, employment of people with disabilities versus people without disabilities. And in second stage then, we can, why not put forward um, employment rates to, to reduce these figures um, 
towards the, the member states. For example, in Flanders, I think it's it's almost 50% the employment rate of people with disabilities. For people for people in general, it's about 76% in, in Flanders. Why not put forward some targets to to reduce the, this gap to all member states? Uh, this could be possible, but the starting point is is of course. Uh, to investigate and to do a good research, I, maybe by Eurostat, an update of their figures of 2011. Um, about Sweden, Samuel, um, maybe Samuel can be uh, compared a little bit with the situation in Flanders, with one exception. They are state owned, Samuel. But it's one big company spread over, over Sweden, but state, uh, state owned. Um, and then maybe um, what we noticed in Flanders and what differs from uh, our situation uh, if we compare with, with some other countries is that what is very important is the support that is given also to, to employers. Um, for custom work companies, for example, what do we get? We do get mainly uh, two kinds of, of support when we engage people with disabilities. In the first place, it is um, a percentage of the salary. Yeah? Uh, and it is between uh, 45 and 60 percent of the salary, depending on uh, the disability. And secondly, and this is also very important, is that we can get um, a fee which varies between 4,500 and about 6,500 per person per year for the guidance of people with disabilities. And this guidance is can be job coaching, but can, for example, also be the fact that we provide um, assistive technology for people with disabilities. For example, if you have only one arm, arm you can use only one arm. Um, we, one of our customer companies is, is using then cobots to replace the, the disability for uh, for this person. So this is very, very, very uh, valuable that you have a good support in terms of a person to percentage of the salary, but as well, uh, good guidance. And also, that's a, a third kind of, of subsidy we get in, in our customer companies, is to take care uh, by this kind of social service of also of non-professional issues for people with disabilities, for example, of, of mobi mobility, um, for example, of, of childcare and so on. This is also very important that this, these aspects are, are also taken into consideration when supporting the employment of people with, with disabilities. Thank you very much. I have a look at my watch. We have to uh, finish at seven o'clock um, on time. Uh, we also agreed this with our sign uh, language interpreters. Um, so I'd like to pick out still a few more questions and um, leave some time for the answers. And then we have to conclude here, unfortunately, um, even though there are still many questions that have not been answered. If your question remains open, remains unanswered, um, or wasn't answered uh, sufficiently, you can write us an email. We are going to forward it uh, to the interlocutors uh, concerned. And uh, this means that nothing will be lost. Unfortunately, in the 15 minutes that remain, we don't have the time to answer everything um, because we have no possibility to extend our meeting beyond 7 p.m. I count on your understanding in this regard. So um, there is Mr. Bauch, or J. Bauch, uh, in Germany, large companies uh, give more contracts or jobs uh, uh, to, to, to workshops, um, but other companies could do that as well. Uh, large companies have their own um, educa um, vocational education possibilities. Uh, couldn't that be a possibility? Couldn't uh, that be a step into the right direction if we uh, went uh, via those companies? That was one thing. And I'm looking now at uh, I'm looking towards Mr. Wolfmeier in Germany. There are also 
um, uh, uh, solutions uh, beyond uh, the sheltered workshop uh, uh, system, but this is also only possible with a budget for work uh, solution, uh, but we'd also need advice. So this is more of a statement, not so much a question than uh, custom work. Uh, this question, I think, has already been answered. And uh, then uh, maybe a direct answer to Mr. Koch. Uh, and uh, then I'll leave you the floor for the answers as to um, the abilities of uh, persons with disabilities. How could we uh, make them visible? Couldn't go this via internship? Could we see here uh, what these persons can perform and what they like to do? Would that be more tangible? Because the experience I make is that uh, uh, there are always tests and tests and tests again that people um, with disabilities have to be submitted, which are not so meaningful and quite strainful for the persons in question. Uh, could this be seen in connection with the EU passport in this respect, which could be interesting also as to the issue of mobility that has been mentioned. Um, if you live in a country like Ireland, Spain, Belgium, uh, if uh, you live in one country like Austria, I want to um, get education in one of those countries, uh, could this passport be used? Uh, the Commission said um, that uh, they will um, adopt proposals in this respect. It's now 10 to 7, and I'd uh, leave you the floor for the answers. Mr. Wolfmeier, did you want the floor? Otherwise, I'd give the floor to Mr. Koch. Gerne, Herr Wolfmeier. Yeah. Now, Franzi Herrn Koch zuerst, natürlich. No, I think Mr. Koch should go first. Okay, so uh, testing. Uh, what was the specific can... question to me? Ein Moment, da ging es, Sie haben... Genau, Sie haben die Testung oder das Herausarbeiten von Fähigkeiten. You were talking about uh, the profiling of um, uh, capacities. Um, uh, of uh, disabled people, uh, but is it not uh, easier to offer internships, for example, to those people to find out for themselves? And I think that Ms. Hartney also referred to that uh, earlier on, that you don't test, test, test all the time, which uh, can be very uncomfortable and very tough on those uh, disabled people. Uh, you, you have to take another test and you fail, and it's just so frustrating. Why not try uh, the internships? Yeah. You know. Good question, uh, because we are doing this indeed. That's. Uh, very important to make the bridge between school and uh, and employment and i think maybe one of the 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 instruments that we are using most frequently are internships uh, indeed i can only uh, confirm what <laughs> what you're saying yeah. and it is even done at uh, i think as from the age of uh, 17 uh, also from special education by the way uh, we are using quite a lot, uh, and even even each customer company is using uh, internships with, with students. I can comment on the Irish situation if if that is helpful. Um, the use of internships is in its early stages and particularly in the public sector. And what our challenge has been is to translate an internship into a real paid job opportunity uh, at the end of the internship. Uh, and that is something that only recently the government have committed to exploring. Another area it, that is underutilized is that of apprenticeships. Um, but recently, uh, the Department of, of Further Education has committed to setting some targets uh, in, in that regard as well, because, again, like an internship or like a, a job placement, an apprenticeship is a very good model for allowing somebody to test what they are good at and to test the, the job itself, whether it is something they enjoy and wish to progress with. Uh, I think just traditionally, 
uh, there has been anxieties um, from employers about apprenticeships for people with disabilities. There have been misperceptions about health and safety risks and things like that. So it is all about the building of awareness uh, and the, the training for the training for employers um, to, to overcome some of those barriers uh, and make it a real opportunity for people with disabilities. Herr Wolfmeier, herzlichen yeah. Dank. Yes, uh, thanks very much, Mr. Wolfmeier. Yes, I would like to uh, come in again. I think the European Union uh, developed uh, something very useful, which is uh, the European uh, Qualifications Framework in order to make your qualifications portable. Um, so I think that the European, the EQF is, um, is a very, very useful instrument for us all. And within the European qualifications framework, you can also validate informal uh, skills and uh, knowledge, uh, for example, the shortly um, uh, explained, the EQF has eight stages, and in Germany and in Austria, um, the uh, leaving certificate of an apprenticeship is equal to level four in the EQF. And we have worked with our partners in, uh, in other countries in Europe, how we could use these different levels of qualifications. So I do think that um, the thinking of the young people or anyone indeed who would like to uh, further qualify themselves for other jobs, uh, they could be um, validated according to the EQF. And it's something that has been introduced already in France, for example. Uh, that's something that I simply wanted to add by ways of information. And I think testing is not uh, the real issue. Uh, they are a problem, of course, but to find out what the abilities and the skills of those young disabled persons are, that is really the most important area of um, of activity that we should uh, develop further. I think it is central for e e profiling your uh, job qualifications. I don't see any uh, further requests for the floor right now. Well, looking, looking at uh, my uh, watch, um, I think uh, that uh, we have... Um, completed the circle uh, but I could I, I have to be honest I could sit here for another two hours and continue discussing with you because I find it very fascinating to see that we are moving but we're not quite where we want to be and we're considering the ratification of new legislation. I think it would be um, enriching to a society in general. I don't quite like the term of enriching because I don't feel that disabled people should be regarded as, as an add-on. They are part and parcel of our society and should be regarded like that. And, and Article 27 of the UN Convention on, on on the rights of disabled persons is very, very clear. Uh, and I think that uh, we should simply live up to the expectations uh, of people uh, and, uh, and attain our objectives uh, that were already um, identified and uh, determined in the last century, if you're, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we must give much more choices to disabled people. Uh, and I think uh, certainly some interests uh, are, are uh, in our way, um, uh, but we are at the European Union with, uh, with 300,000 and more 
uh, people who should be interested in in order to facilitate a transitions uh, and i think that within the two hours that we've uh, spent together in this webinar we uh, simply I had an opportunity to have a first glance um, on the situation. Thank you so much to all the presenters uh, for having shared um, their views with us. Um, Ms. Langensiepen kindly thanks the interpreters for uh, the support offered. Without you, she says, we would not have been able to have such a lively de debate and uh, the whole that webinar would have fallen through. So thank you very much uh, to everyone for your active uh, participation and contribution. It's a great joy uh, for me to, to um, meet uh, people and uh, guest speakers uh, in uh, uh, such webinars. Uh, please do send us emails uh, with all your questions and comments if you feel like it. Um, have a safe trip home, I feel like saying. Um, and if you're at home, then simply stay safe and healthy. And uh, we all look forward, I think, to traveling across Europe again, once again soon, from Ireland to Belgium, to Austria and to Germany. Goodbye.